Okay, so now let's talk about EFS in a bit more details than usual. So the use cases for DFS, we know it's when we have content management, when we want to serve data across a different amount of web servers, share data, WordPress, all these kind of things. For using EFS, you need to have a Linux-based system. It does not work for Windows, and it's going to be POSIX compliant. It uses the NFS v4.1 protocol, and you're able to control access to your EFS drive across with security groups. You get encryption at rest using KMS, and you can only attach to one VPC. You can create one ENI mount target per AZ to get some redundance. Now, let's talk about the performance and storage classes of EFS. This is where it gets most important. So EFS scale to thousands of NFS clients concurrently, and you can get 10 gigabyte plus per second throughput. So this is a great network drive for your EC2 instances. And on top of it, you can grow to petabyte scale network file system so you can store a lot of data in your EFS drives. Now, for performance, it is set at EFS creation time and you have two performance modes. The first one is general purpose, which is the default. This is when you have a latency sensitive use case, for example, a web server, a CMS, etc. Or you can get max IO. This is going to be higher latency, but you're also going to get higher throughput and it's going to be a lot more parallel. So think of big data, media processing, and so on. In terms of the throughput mode now, you get bursting mode, which is common for file system, where you know nothing, most of the time nothing happens, but then you start modifying some files and there is some intensive work to do. And this bursting mode performance is going to be linked to the file system size. So the more data you have in your file system, the more you're gonna be able to burst efficiently. Or you can go to provisioned IO mode, in which case you're gonna choose a high throughput to storage ratio in case the burst is not enough, and that's gonna be a more expensive option. So think of it as like, you have, don't have that much data, you don't have that many files, but you want extremely high throughput, then you're going to have to go for provisioned IO mode for EFS. Then there is storage tiers for EFS. This is very similar to S3, so it's a lifecycle management feature to move a file to a new tier after n number of days. So the standard is going to be for frequently accessed files, and then you're going to get infrequent access tier. It's going to be higher cost to retrieve the files, but obviously a lower price point to store the files on EFS. Now I'm giving you all these details, probably knew all these things, but you have to remember them going into the exam. Another thing we have to talk about is the solution architecture around EFS. So EFS works within your VPC, we know this, and we can have multiple ENI, so one ENI per AZ to get some redundancy in the mount targets. And it's possible for us to have another VPC through VPC peering to access our EFS file system. So that means that EC2 instances in another VPC, thanks to VPC peering, can access our EFS network file system. But it's also possible to have access to, the, to EFS through the on-premise server. For this, you have to either set up Direct Connect or an end a site-to-site -site VPN, and I'm saying or end because you may want some redundancy in your Direct Connect or have a failover, for example, to your VPN. And then the on-premise server can access EFS, but only by using the IPv4 of the ENI, so the private IPv4, not by using the DNS name. This is a feature that's not supported right now. So that means that your EFS can work across multiple accounts and even on-premise. And this is a very important point to remember how this works into the exam. All right, that's it for this lecture. I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next lecture.